Hello everyone, I'm Shub and you're watching F1 Aeronomicist. Well, it has begun. The F1 season is finally started. And in this video, we're going to look at the Bahrain Grand Prix. And what I'm going to do in this is I'm going to use some of the charts that I've generated in the telemetry analysis on some of my other social media platforms and try and connect those with the main takeaways of the entire race. So let's dive into it then. Well, the first takeaway is that Red Bulls are not just fast, they are very fast. And to show you how fast they are, let me pull up this plot of FP2 race pace and the actual race pace on the right hand side. So you can see that there were already indications that Red Bull was a much better race pace car also added to its quality brilliance. And you can see that the Red Bull was 0.5 to 1 second faster than the entire field um, throughout the race. And that is quite impressive, keeping in mind that Verstappen was never really challenged and he would have been doing tire management and nobody really pushed him and he was still lapping a second faster than everybody else. So this is something to watch out for. We might have a season of Red Bull dominance if this, if this really keeps continuing. The second takeaway is we have a new team who's coming up and challenging the big three. And man, this team has made some noise this weekend. Um, you know, personally, I started watching F1 in 2007 and it was the Hamilton versus Alonso era. And I've waited 10 years to see Mr. Fernando Alonso fight with the top teams in equal mercenary. And it was the kid inside me got reignited when I saw these battles against Hamilton and against Sainz. And the way he could place his car literally on any part of the track was extremely impressive. And what I want to highlight is the amount of mechanical grip that Aston Martin seems to have over its nearest competitors compared to Ferrari and Hamilton. And this will mean that, you know, when we go to tracks which are low speed dominated, the Aston Martin might be the most competitive package among them, uh, especially on this kind of race tracks. What is also impressive is that as soon as Alonso got ahead of Sainz, his race pace, as you can see in this arrow, landed up dropping to that of Max Verstappen. So does this mean that Alonso had very good race pace on the hard tires and maybe he was the only one who could probably match uh, similar lap times to that of Red Bull? What would happen if Alonso did not fall behind at the start? Could he on merit challenge Perez challenged Leclerc if he had not gotten out. Well, these are questions whose answers we'll find very soon in the next couple of races. But I'm really excited to see Alonso fight with Hamilton, with Sainz, with Leclerc, with Perez, with Verstappen. It's going to be an epic year, guys, because when it comes to Fernando Alonso, there are no cards left on the table. Yeah. So the third takeaway is that Mercedes versus Ferrari is going to be a close battle this year, at least in the races. The Ferrari seems to be a much faster car in quality uh, compared to the Mercs, but the Mercs seems to be equal in pace, a bit similar like last year, where Ferrari would be brilliant in quality and then would struggle in the race and then Mercedes would eventually get them in the race on race pace. But we have still problems at Ferrari. They promised a bomb of an engine and then they produced that. However, we are hearing noises that it wasn't an engine problem. It was an ECU problem or an electrical problem, which they can quickly fix. So, you know, in this race, you did see that Hamilton could not overtake signs. And that is basically because how fast the Ferraris were on the straight lines compared to that of the Mercs. They did have a speed advantage. So I'm expecting a year of a close fight between the Ferrari and the Mercedes for the third place, maybe. Who knows? Because you can expect that consistency from Alonso. As you can probably imagine, I've become a big Alonso fanboy. Or the kid inside me has reignited. What is interesting in this plot is that you can see that Sainz almost flat line on his pace. Uh, he was extremely consistent. He couldn't push the car harder. And he was doing a good job at, you know, getting the best out of the Ferraris. Um, although I still see when I was looking at the lap times, I could see that Leclerc was half a second faster than Sainz on race pace, which is puzzling to me because Sainz himself is a decent driver, but on race pace being four tenths, five tenths slower than Leclerc, that's not cool, right? 
But what was cool was that the battle between Sainz and Alonso allowed Hamilton to close in and then Hamilton was trying to pressurize Sainz but really couldn't have a real go at him because Sainz started driving maybe more defensively because they were on the same tires and these cars are almost similarish paced and I think there was not enough speed delta or performance delta for the Mercedes really to send one down the inside or the outside of Sainz. And you can also see that Lance Stroll is finished ahead of George Russell, which also is quite big because you can imagine that this is an Aston Martin in the hands of a person who is not the most talented driver. He is a talented driver himself, but he just came from an injury. He is not 100% fit as we saw in the free practice sessions and he's not the best driver and yet he was able to outrace Russell in this race. And that is big news because this car, guys, is only going to get faster. It's, it's a new car. They have to learn how to set it up and they're going to make improvements on this car, which will definitely improve their race pace and quality pace going ahead just through setup and not through upgrades. So again, as I said, I'm really excited for Aston Martin's resurgence almost in, in the sport. And the fourth takeaway is that we have a new Formula 1.5 leaders, maybe. Um, Alfa Romeo showed a lot of promise. Alpines would be disappointed to be on still in Formula 1.5 as we so call it because they would have wanted to take the jump. Uh, but Alfa was very, very impressive uh, in the hands of both Bottas and Zhao. And what was interesting is that after qualifying, we thought Williams and Alfa Tauri were way behind compared to the other teams in Formula 1.5. But in the race, they really showed their hand. Maybe what they did was they set up the car for the race and compromised their quality because Williams and Alfa Tauri were flying, uh, especially in the hands of Albon. What I can make out from this is that the Formula 1.5 is going to be quite close. There, are, there is not going to be one or two teams completely left behind. Q3 is, in itself is going to be interesting because there's going to be a fight between Williams, Alfa Tauri, Haas and McLaren to get to fight for those positions of 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, right? And the big, the big disappointment obviously was McLaren. They've had such a disappointing start to the year. They have given us promises that they're going to bring a new car, but who knows how competitive that is going to be. But I really hope as a McLaren fanboy myself that they build a car that is at least able to challenge the Alpines by the end of the season. And you can't really expect them to challenge the top four anymore. Yes, we've got a top four in 2023, which is very exciting. And just Overall, in, in terms of sport, I think the cars were much closer this year in terms of their performance gap. F1 2023 is going to be lit. Well, if you've enjoyed this video, give me a like and subscribe. I'm going to do more of these videos every race weekend and I'm going to include more and more race plots uh, to try and give you a perspective of takeaways with data. I think that's quite cool in its own right. Uh, if you just want to see the plots and not live, want to listen to me talk all the time, why don't you go and follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. I promise, no chatter, just information and great information. Thank you, and you're watching F1 Error Analysis.